Can you see my screen? Yeah. yeah. Nice. OK, so some quick um, logistics as usual. Let me copy this. It should already be there in our previous chat. Let me check. From the last session, I probably will copy from there. Yeah, here it is. OK, I'm going to repaste this here. So if you wanted to contact um, uh, us in any ways, uh, the first two emails support at decoding 5G.zone, sponsor at decoding 5G.zone. Appreciate you reaching out to us. Um, all the tools and uh, everything that we use for the tool uh, for this particular course um, costs money. So uh, any donation will be welcome. Um, and you can register. Please uh, ensure that you register for the future events. Uh, this is the fourth line here is the link for it. You can go and register and when you register, it will send you the reminders and things like that. Um, so that way it's it's easy. And the last one is if you are lazy to go to the Eventbrite and um, then join the sessions, just copy and paste this uh, in some notepad or, or you know you can create in your own Outlook uh, some meeting invite. Uh, by just clicking this, you will be able to join. Right. So those are the key messages that I wanted to give from the logistics point of view. Um, you guys can hear me okay, right? I have a little low voice today, but uh, hopefully you guys can hear me. It's got it. It's fine. Okay, perfect. So you all know what is decoding 5G dot um, zone. Uh, the target is, it, you know, it's a non-profit uh, initiative. Uh, it's not a for-profit initiative. Um, it's basically done together by the volunteers who are participating in the session. And uh, only those um, who are participating in the sessions are the ones that you guys see. But behind the scene, there are around 10 to 15 different volunteers are working on multiple different uh, activities to make this happen um, as a non-profit initiative. The goal is to really help uh, individuals to skill up and innovation up on uh, 5G technology. That's the thought process. And what we wanted to really do, this is our fifth session. But those who have not um, attended the previous sessions, what you can do is you can go to YouTube. Let's see if I can quickly. You can just go to the YouTube um, and you can search the stopper. So this is the nonprofit organization, which is basically a uh, organizing the session, right? So you can go to the playlists. There is a decoding 5G dot zone. You can click and then you will see last five sessions. Um, this is the six sessions actually, right? Last five section uh, recording. So those who have missed can always go back and listen to that video. OK. Awesome. So now you have um, everything that is related to the logistics. Um, like I mentioned, what we wanted to really achieve, uh, I think it's a 12 session program. Five, this is a sixth session and we have six more session. Uh, what we wanted to really achieve is uh, two things, right? One thing is we wanted to help you guys to build both theoretical as well as on the practical aspects of um, whatever expertise that you would require to build your 5, 5G knowledge, right? So that's the 5G knowledge slash expertise. That's our first goal. And then the second goal is um, we wanted to see if you are able to, uh, you know, kind of download um, the practical open source magma and play around um, uh, by yourself and able to do end to end calls with multiple different um, um, you know um, tools that are available out there to get a feel of end to end um, um, you know um, end to end 5G network right so that's the second goal and we call it as an ecosystem and uh, for this I have to um, really thank Wave Labs for providing their labs for for people to kind of play around and uh, learn end to end uh, ecosystem. Um, from their innovation and research lab. So this is, these are the two things that we wanted to really achieve together as a team. Um, so every session, what we do is we start with uh, first 20, 25 minutes uh, on the theory, theoretical aspect and then the remaining 20, 20, 25 minutes on the practical aspect. So far, what we have done is we have um, on the theory aspects, we have understood um, you know, the, the evolution of the wireline networks and we have understood um, the evolution of the wireless networks. And in the wireless networks, the number of things that we have understood today, what we will learn is um, concept wise. 
just a refresher of the core network and radio followed by uh, transport network and network slicing right so that's those are the four key areas that we will slightly touch upon and the first two areas which is core network and radio network is something that we have already learned together in our previous session you can always go and um, look up the uh, video to do that and after that uh, sashidhar will jump in and he will continue um, the hands on practical um, uh, aspects of it in our last session what we did was we in, in the previous sessions what we did was we were able to help you guys how to download uh, the the magma how to install the magma and how can you use the simulators to uh, make an end to end call and then uh, what we started doing is getting into the depth of the call flow right so in our in our previous session um, yokesh did a wonderful job of uh, explaining the registration call flow and different messages and um, and he practically executed it and he showed that in wireshark um, and and so on and today is shashidhar is going to um, continue on the um, pdu session aspect of it so you guys can understand the remaining uh, portion of the 5, 5g and 2n call flow in a more practical sense okay so let's continue <laughs> the theoretical theoretical aspects and try to talk next 20 minutes before we hand over the session to sashidhar i'll pause here for any questions before uh, before we move on is, is all good you guys can hear me well it's all good yes sir we're all good perfect okay. let's learn something together um, today so on the wireless networks what we Okay, just a refresher, quick one. What we did, what we learned was the evolution of 1G to 5G, and we learned 5G is custom built for um, connected industries, right? What does it mean um, by connected industries? Is um, you know enabling um, different uh, industries uh, with whatever that they require, um, the tech stack, whatever uh, you know is required uh, to enable different types of communications, right? Uh, before. um the evolution of the wireless technology we were doing only person to person communication 4g we started doing person to mission um and now with 5g we can do not only person to person person to mission and mission to mission communication um because it's ground up uh, built for the connected industries ability to provide the higher throughput lower latency and you know uh, massive connections of uh, iot devices um that can enable us with a number of different uh, use cases and we strongly believed that um, 6g will be the continuation of the 5g um, and further enhance the all the parameters that we that 5g supports today from latency to the throughput plus um, it will take the automation um, and and intelligence of the network to the all to the, all all to the completely a new new level right so that's the kind of an understanding that we had then we what then we started understanding the end to end network um starting from the air interface to the radio um to the transport network and the core network and the management aspect of sbss oss and so on then we got into the depth of um how the different types of networks evolved um over the period of time um this number of things has happened and 5g as such can um, today like i mentioned help us with a lot of use cases for connected industries um um from mission to mission to um, person to mission and also not only that it can also enable and help you with um, mission business critical and mission critical applications in the earlier generation you were just supporting the the use cases that are just business supportive use cases like voice um you know data messaging and so on but now you can monitor the airport and you can monitor the air control train control so business critical machine critical related use cases also it can support and we looked at um, the high level architecture of the 5g network and then we jumped into um, the core network architecture and we learned different network functions within the core network architecture uh, one of the key message um, before i move on is to really understand 5g is designed like a web 2.0 probably will support web 3.0 related style right uh it's called as a service based architecture style um, no most of the interfaces are defined uh, through through http protocol and and the payload are taken through either json or um, or xml uh, depending upon um, how you how you design it right so that's going to really help us to enable a very um, a flexible um, and disaggregated uh, uh, network we are you know we can design because of that right so that's the key message i want to give you and we also talked about number of different network functions and most importantly i like to 
kind of bring up a bring up this NWDAF. This this is the one which is going to play put a at least from the core network point of view, it's going to uh, put the network to a level of connected intelligence, right? Connected intelligence, okay? Um, because the NWDAF is nothing but a you know it's a data and analytics function, and um, you know it allows you to collect different types of data from the core network and uh, see what exactly is happening, and then you can take actions based on what is happening and what's going to happen in the future. These are all the step towards the fully connected intelligent uh, networks and use cases and the future of ours, right? So, so from the core network point of view, NWDAF is, is going to play a critical role there. Then we started looking into the radio access network. And uh, what we understood was, um, you know, because we are focusing on a disaggregated uh, deployment in 5G, um, even in the radio network, there is a lot of uh, changes compared to the 4G. Um, so they kind of splitted uh, the radio separately and then the control plane separately and then the user plane and data plane separately and they came up with a nice architecture with different new interfaces. Um, and each of these different uh, functions does different things, right? Like we discussed, are you use the radio side, do you use the data side and see use the control side. And in, on, on top of all these things, uh, what is also more important, like NWDAF in the radio, you have... Um, you know, RIC, near real-time RIC and uh, non-real-time RIC. These, these are the intelligent nodes in the radio side, which will enable you again to build a, a connected intelligent um, uh, radio network, right? So these are all the domain, these are called as a domain uh, intelligent uh, nodes, uh, like NWDAF is for uh, core network and um, near real-time RIC and non-real-time uh, non RIC is for the radio network. And then you can have one master uh, um, management entity that can control all these domain entity to build the end-to-end -end, uh, um, connected uh, uh, intelligence and automated networks. Okay, so when I say connected intelligence and automation network means you you are able to, um, you know, run the network uh, automatically with minimum uh, manual uh, intervention. It gives it opens up the intelligence, uh, it opens up um, uh, the the innovation. And um, you know it it uh, brings AI to really help to build the uh, automated network. Then the other most important thing uh, that I wanted to share, which connects to uh, next five minutes that I'm going to talk about transport network, is um, the different um, uh, ways that you can split the radio network. Right? Um, the way that I explained last time is uh, the radio network has uh, different stacks. Right? The physical layer all the way to the stack, and then the application the RRC and uh, mobility management, session management, and so on on top of that. So depending on um, how you are going to slice and dice these uh, different layers of the stack, um, you can build different network function, this disaggregated network function, right? Like for example, if you're going to split at uh, this level, you can have RU, right? And even RU, you can split it into two, RU high and RU low, right? Uh, depending upon uh, how you wanted to do it. Then DU can support some, uh, you know, physical layer, high layer, high level physical layer, and then the MAC layer and RLC. CU can support PDCP and SD, SDAP, right? So this is how um, the network functions are, are uh, defined based on which stack level it actually supports and enables the disaggregation of the RAN network for us to uh, deploy it depending upon uh, various different use cases that demands um, for you to deploy, right? In some cases, you might want it to deploy everything together as an aggregated node. In some cases, you wanted to just split RU and keep DU and CU as an aggregated node. In some cases, you wanted to uh, split all the three and do it. And it completely depends on the use case that you're going to do it, right? And uh, the way that you split, um, the different network functions are defined. And also, it's, it's also defined as options, right, in the standards. So if you're going to split CU and DU slash RU, it's called option two, right? And if you're going to split uh, just RU and keep CU and DU, it's going to call as an option eight. So this is a very basic thing that you need to understand, but it's very easy. Just slicing and dicing of the stack in different ways gives you multiple different options, gives you multiple ways of deploying the RAN network in a disaggregated way. That is the most important thing that you need to understand. Um, so why, why I wanted to kind of stress upon on that is, um, you know, to jump into this transport, but before jumping into this transport, just to cover this, today, if you actually look at it, 
um, the way the radio networks are designed, multiple phones are covered within an area, right? And moving forward, because of a lot of different technologies that are out there at our disposal right now, from MIMO to beam forming to, um, you know, complex technologies, right? We, we, we would be able to really, you know, do a beam for a particular user and move the beam around wherever he goes to provide a very dedicated, low latency um, services and so on, right? So these are all the different technologies that allows you to uh, achieve that in the uh, um, in the 5G technology. And all that 5G promises um, for, for us to achieve for different use cases. Okay, now having said that, I just go back to the trans stack split and CUDU. Having said that, uh, what's more important to understand is um, you have a dev devices, right? Like phone, then you have a antenna, which is a RU, right? And then you can have a RAN that is split into DU and CU. And then you can also further split it, but just for the simplicity, uh, let's say you have a DU and CU. Um, then you have a core network and some of the core networks can sit in the edge, like UPF can sit in the edge. But in this diagram, the UPF and the SMF, UDM, AUF is actually sitting in the um, centralized cloud, right? But you can also split these network functions and put it in the different location depending upon your use cases. But the message that I wanted to give you here is that all these different network functions, RU, DU, CU, and all the core network network functions, all has to be connected together, right? So what enables that connection is the transport network, right? All the wires and cables, routers, hubs, switches, um, aggregators, disaggregators, everything that makes up your transport network. And transport network runs um, not only within the premise, but also runs across cities and even countries under the seas and things like that, as you guys know. Okay. So now when it comes to the transport, that's, that's what the transport network is all about. So when it comes to the transport network, there are few terms that you need to remember. Uh, front hall, mid hall, and back hall. You know, when you, wherever you go, you would probably, um, you know, um, hearing these words or, or discussing these words, or these words are discussed in a forum, right? So you need to basically know what does it mean. So you, you already know what the devices are, you already know what the RAN is, score network is, and different functions are. When it comes, comes to transport, whatever that connects the RU and DU, right? So it's normally uh, from the antenna all the way to the DU, they normally call it as a front hall. Remember these words, right? And then the one that connects DU to CU and all those kind of things um, at the edge, they are called as a mid hall. And then which connects to the central cloud somewhere in the national or, or even you know citywide or whatever, right? Um, statewide uh, uh, and so on. Those are called as a back hall. So just remember these three things, right? So front hall, mid hall, and back hall. Um, those are the words that are used for the transport networks that connects the different network function in an end-to-end -end 5G network. Okay, now it's that you know these three words, right? Front hall, back hall, and um, uh, mid hall and back hall. Uh, in the olden days, I just kind of put it here: access, aggregation, and core. These are these words are also used, right? Um, so access um, can also be repeatedly um, referred for front hall. Aggregation can be um, repeatedly referred for mid hall, and um, core can be repeatedly referred for back hall. So just remember these these uh, words, right? So the different lines that connects. Um, all the different types of devices, aggregation devices, and all in all these three areas makes up your transport network. Now, transport network has its own uh, technology, right? Um, you know, in the 4G, it, it was using CIPRI, OPSI, right? Uh, but in 5G, there are a number of different technologies that are available um, that can enable you, depending upon the different use cases, different types of speed, right? 100 gig to 400 gig to 500, uh, you know, 400 gig, right? So, you, what you see here are some of the technologies. Mostly nowadays, eCIPRI is used on uh, between RU to um, DU, right? And then uh, between DU to CU, mostly it is uh, um, F1. And then uh, on the core network, it's mostly the Ethernet 100 gig to 400 gig uh, Ethernet, right? It can also be an optical network, OTN and uh, OTUs uh, and so on. But you, what is important for you to understand is these are all the different uh, uh, you know, transport uh, networks and technologies that connects all these different radio, um, uh, mid hall, uh, sorry, radio um, to core network uh, from the point of view of uh, front hall, mid hall to back hall in the transport network. Okay. And the transport network also plays a very, very critical role, right? So 5G promises 10 millisecond latency means it's not just the radio network provides 10 millisecond latency. Okay. It's a combination of radio network, core network, transport network. And even in some cases, the management network, if there's a query back and forth, together it has to provide that kind of a 
uh, low latency so you can um, you know um, do uh, applications uh, that require for the low latency and so on uh, it's not only low latency but also for the high throughput and um, high capacity as well okay so this is the transport network the bare minimum you need to understand that now it's that you know you have devices you have radio you have core network you have transport network um, in the past what happens is the whole network used to be a monolithic network okay and um, now the 5G Allah brings in a concept called a network slicing. And uh, what it can do is it can split the network uh, into multiple slices, right? Like a bread slice, multiple slices. And each of these slices has its own uh, characteristics, meaning you can allocate the radio resources, um, core network resources, um, you know, transport resources, and also the infrastructure resources. Because I have, you know, even though we talked about RAN, core, and transport, we kind of forgot the infrastructure, right? The infrastructure, what I mean by that is um, the different servers, because nowadays all these uh, radio um, core and everything is software only, right? So the software basically sits in the uh, servers, bunch of servers in multiple data centers or in a dedicated devices, right? Um, so, so you have lots of infrastructure available, and then you have an infrastructure software that manages those infrastructures like virtual virtual missions and uh, um, containers managed by different platforms like OpenStack to Kubernetes and so on, right? So that also an infrastructure. So combining your radio transport core and infrastructure, everything together, you can build either a monolithic network or you can slice and dice all these resources to build multiple different network sliced uh, network. <laughs> okay, let me put it like that. So each of this network slice can support one particular use case. So if you look at from the 5G point of view, we have three things, right? One is uh, throughput, high throughput, low latency, and uh, massive machine communication. So you can either do the slice as these three slice, or you can even do the slice as different use cases and services that you provide. You can build your own slice for automotive. You can build your own size for agriculture, IoT. You can build an another slice for enterprise um, uh, to support an enterprise private LTE, you can support, you can create an another slice to do a FWA. You can, I mean, you can create different types of slice to support different types of use cases, right? So this is the very powerful feature for in, in 5G where you are able to slice the biggest network into multiple slices, allocate the resources um, from radio to the transport, to the core, to the infrastructure that is required to provide the SLA, that meaning service level agreement uh, for that particular use case that you are serving for from that particular slice, right? This is a very important concept that you need to understand. And uh, and uh, the standards in 5G is defined, um, uh, which allows you to do this end-to-end, -end, from RAN to transport to core to infrastructure to the management entities, okay? And last but not least, <clears throat> what I wanted to uh, talk about is a private network. See, in the olden days, what happened was uh, the barrier to entry was very, very you know, um, high, meaning if I if we need to know any of these technologies, 2G, 3G, we got to really work in a big companies um, to, to really know that and uh, learn that, right? Now, because of um, uh, the, the innovation and the open sources that are out there, um, every one of us can uh, you know, make our hands dirty and learn how to deploy into a network and a lot of innovative companies uh, have born and I believe continue to bond uh, to support um, uh, deploying number of small, small networks, right? It's not, no more required to build one monolithic network to serve everyone, but you can build small, small networks to serve um, different, different um, use cases and different, different communities and different, different uh, enterprises. So the way that uh, most of the um, uh, experts envision is, uh, moving forward, you're going to have multiple smaller networks, either independent, dedicated, smaller networks, private networks, um, or or network sliced based uh, private networks that will be available. Um, and that all networks has to be managed rather than uh, managing a monolithic network. The problem space is completely shifted, right? From managing from one monolithic network to managing multiple networks because it will have its own challenges. Um, so that's something that I wanted you guys to really uh, keep that in your mind. Just to sum up, um, before I give it to Shashi, um, so monolithic network is public networks, private networks are all small, small networks that you can deploy uh, with all those uh, um, beautiful open sources that are available or, or closed source that are 
built by companies, uh, many companies uh, like Salona and many other companies, right? Um, you can build uh, the private networks. So this is particular slide is very simple uh, a slide to sum up whatever that you have learned so far in the wireless network, right? So the left-hand side is the public wireless network and right-hand side is the private wireless network. Mostly public wireless networks are provided by the service providers like telecom service providers, satellite service providers, web service providers, and so on. And um, private networks, you can actually, um, you know, provided by the smaller, uh, um, provided to the smaller enterprises and different verticals like manufacturing verticals and so on. Um, and uh, you can also provide uh, those services to the enterprises through network slicing in the using the public network. On the private network, smaller network, you can provide that as a dedicated network to them. And mostly the public networks are owned by the providers and uh, dedicated network um, can be owned by the enterprises, right? Uh, let's say, for example, Wave Labs can help to deploy the private um, on-premise dedicated network uh, and, and help them to maintain it, but the network can be owned by the enterprises, right? And uh, mostly the public networks um, is used for business-driven communication. Private networks can be used for business critical and mission critical. Uh, but if you use the network slicing based public network, you can still deliver business critical and mission critical uh, uh, applications. It's a trade off, right? Do you want it to keep everything in house and build a complete uh, dedicated private network for yourself or avail the private network provided as a network slicing by the service providers um, and deploy in your um, uh, enterprise? It's completely up to you to decide which way to go. There is one, there is never one shirt fits all. Um, it's depending upon the different use cases you choose what is the right network and right technology for you. Okay, so I will pause here um, and in our next session, we will start learning about other additional uh, adjacent technologies that makes up uh, the network more, more intelligent, right? Like cloud, NFE, SDN and so on. We will start learning um, from the theory point of view in our uh, next session on adjacent technologies. And then we will start learning about standard and open sources and um, last but not least spectrum, right? So in next uh, six sessions uh, to seven session in the theory slide, uh, this is what you will learn. By end of the session, right? Um, you would probably understand a big picture, um, theoretically end-to-end -end picture, and also practically um, how to uh, really, you know, develop and uh, build and um, uh, deploy and monitor the, uh, you know, uh, smaller networks, um, let be a FWA or private networks. Okay, I'll pass here for any questions. Hopefully it was useful, guys. Awesome, perfect. Hey, Suresh. Uh, yes, Kadar. That this is awesome. It was okay. I was a little bit sick. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. You are fitting. You are yeah, fit today. All good, Kadar. All right. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to stop the screen share and hand over it to Sashi there. Sashi, um, all to you. Um, the second 30 minutes of today's session is hands on um, uh, learning uh, through the open source magma. Go ahead, Sashi. Uh, let me know if my screen is visible, right? Yes. Yes. Much visible, Sashi. Are you are you nervous? Are you okay? <laughs> no, I am okay. All good. Awesome. Go ahead. This is the way we get there. Uh, so uh, I'd like to take a minute to just recap on uh, recap on what uh, what was covered in the previous practical sessions. So uh, we in the in the very first session we. Uh, uh, demonstrated how to install Magma and how to fire it up. And along with it, we also uh, connected to the open source uh, simulators, that is the OAI GNB. And the uh, second session, that the, the follow-up session, um, also had uh, the, where we explained in detail uh, the registration call flow. So today, uh, we will be uh, going through the PDU session demo. So in this session, we'll be going through what is PDU session, and what are the important parameters that are involved with it? Uh, we'll touch upon QoS flow. Since QoS flow in itself is a very important topic, we'll be covering it, covering it up in, in depth in the upcoming sessions. Then we'll take a look at the message exchanges and the call flows, followed up by PCAP analysis. And finally, we shall end it with a short demo. OK, sounds good. Let's go. So. Till now, we have understood how exactly the UE registers itself, how the core network is able to authenticate that UE, 
now what happens how how exactly the ue communicates to the data network so once the ue is registered and is connected the ue re requests for a pdu session so uh, a pdu session is required for the ue to actually talk to the data network or to exchange any traffic or any information to pass from the ue to data network or vice versa so we can define it as a pdu session provides an end to end user plane connectivity between the ue and the data network through the upf or terms we can say that pdu session is a set of connections from ue to gnb then gnb to upf and upf to data network let's now to, uh, take a look at the pdu session parameters so uh, the first one is pdu session identifier what exactly is it as the name suggests pdu session id is an identifier of the pdu session at the ue and as well as the core network what is s nssai it it's basically the slice identifier it refers to the slice uh, network slice in which the pdu session is created then what is dnn so dnn uh, stands for data network name and dnn is the name of the data network to which the pdu session provides connectivity uh, pdu session type this defines the end user protocol carried by the pdu session it can be either ipv4 we have ipv6 we have ipv4 v6 as well gone oh sorry uh, yeah so uh so in in 5g the quality of service is managed at a qos flow level as we understand there is uh, there needs to be a pdu session created for the traffic to flow and within this pdu session there is a qos flow so what exactly now is qos flow so qos flow is the lowest granularity within the 5g system on which a po policy or charging can be enforced uh what exactly it means uh, is qos flow carries all the characteristics like latency or uh, data rate or priority so different qos flows have different uh, characteristics qos flow qos flow is identified by qfi so qfi uh, uh, is uh, qfi is nothing but the qos flow identifier so when a pdu session is created Uh, always there is uh, uh, there is there is one qos flow that is created along with it which is called as the default qos flow this qos uh, qos flow remains until the lifetime of the pdu session so whenever uh, to uh, sum it up whenever ue latches on to the network and is registered and authenticated at least one pdu session is created for it and then a default qos flow is added to it this default qos flow will remain up to the uh, uh, end of the uh, end of the pdu session going on uh, within this pdu session there can be multiple qos flows based on the uh, require uh, based on the requirements of the service so um, so for for a ue there can be multiple pdu sessions similarly depending upon the type of traffic there can be multiple qos flows within the pdu session and every quality of service flow will have its own unique characteristics based on uh, like i said latency priority and data rate and all these qof flows are identified by a qfi that is qos flow identifier now uh, let's take a look at um, at this uh, very important diagram so uh, there is our ue or this is our mobile device or you can call it cpe and then uh, we have our ran that is here uh, gnb then we have our upf that is nothing but user plane function and beyond this we have our data network connected through the n6 interface so um, let's uh, now take an example or 
uh, uh, this uh, the yellow part is your PDU session. When the PDU uh, every UE will uh, will have uh, can have multiple PDU sessions. Uh, each PDU session there is a single tunnel that is created between the GNB and the UPF, and on the uh, radio side we have. Uh, radio resources that are allocated, which are called, uh, which are termed as uh, data radio bearer. So a uh, single PDU can consist of multiple data radio bearers and multiple QoS flows, uh, but a single PDU is mapped to a single tunnel. Whenever, uh, so uh, let's take a scenario. Whenever the UV, uh, UV goes active, suppose uh, we have, uh, Let's take uh, let's take an example of an OTT platform. What happens first? Uh, the UE first is registered and authenticated, and then uh, a default QoS flow is uh, created here. Once the default QoS flow is up, it then require uh, it it then requests for uh, an OTT uh, service. Suppose Netflix. Then what happens is. Uh, Whatever the service that service uh, requires, all the resources is passed on to the uh, PCF, that is policy control function, and then all uh, a new QoS flow is created with the required characteristics. So the new QoS, which is QoS flow, which is created, will um, will have all the traffic uh, leading to that OTT platform, and uh, all the uh, the PDU session creation deletion. And modification is um, uh, is respo is uh, taken care of by SMF. Uh, on the uh, like I said, so um, the QoS flow. Suppose the UE requires another service like a WhatsApp video call or something. Uh, if if the current DRB is not supporting uh, that particular QoS flow, it creates another. Uh, uh, DRB and then that QS flow is taken forward. Uh, now summarizing, uh, uh, now summarizing. So what 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 we did here is we understood what, how UE react. Uh, UE talks to GNB and the UPF. How the QS flows are uh, formed. Uh, the Q, uh, so. A PDU session can have multiple QoS flows. A PDU session can have multiple data radio bearers. A PDU session is mapped to a single tunnel. A uh, data radio bearer is allowed to support one uh, is uh, can support one or more QoS flows, and so on. Uh, so let's take a look at the uh, call flow. So we have our CP or the RAN. Then uh, we have our MME, AMF, we have mobility D, we have subscriber DB, which stores all the information of the subscribers. We have session D, which, which is nothing but the SMF. We have policy DB, which stores uh, all the policy information. We have pipeline D, which is nothing but our UPF. So what happens exactly? Uh, the UE sends the PDU session establishment request, it lands on AMF. AMF then forwards this uh, message to session D, that is nothing but SMF. SMF fetches the required policy details from the policy DB and then forwards it to the pipeline D. The pipeline D respond, uh, responds back to the session D, that is the SMF. The session D then responds back to the AMF. Uh, and, the, uh, and the AMF, then sends a PDU session resource setup request to the GNB and it piggybacks it with PDU session establishment accept message also. So what happens here is uh, uh, the PDU session resource setup request lands on GNB and if the GNB is able to allocate all the resources which are required for this PDU session, then it accepts it and the PDU session establishment accept message is sent or is forwarded to UE and the GNB also sends a PDU session resource setup response back to the AMF. Uh, take a negative scenario when the GNB is not able to allocate all the resources. What it does is it simply um, drops the PDU session establishment packet and then 
uh, it sends a reject message back to AMF. So just to um, uh, just to summarize again, what happens? UE sends establishment request. It is forwarded to the SMF. SMF fetches all the policies, and then it is forwarded to Pipeline D. Pipeline D responds back. SMF responds back to AMF. Here, SMF, uh, sorry, AMF um, sends a PDU session resource setup request saying, GNB, these are my resources which are, which are required for this PDU session. Are you able to allocate it? So along with that, it also sends an establishment accept message. So once the GNB is uh, able to allocate allocate the resources, it basically uh, forwards this establishment accept to the UE and uh, sends a response back to the AMF. Let's now uh, take a look at the PCAPs. Uh, so till now, up to uh, up to this session, we have seen how uh, uh, we have seen all the messages like the uh, initial UE message and the initial contact setup response. All uh, the all the registration and the authentication flow is covered. So let us take a look what happens after the registration complete. Like I said, the UE will send. Uh, uh, send the AMF a PDU session establishment request. So uh, then what happens is AMF, uh, AMF sends to the GNB a PDU session resource setup request. So this is this is the same request uh, which is happening here. Uh, basically it tells G B that whatever uh, resources are allocated, are you able to allocate it? Like uh, it, uh, yeah. So after that, what happens is it is piggybacked with PDU session establishment accept message. So uh, uh, PDU session establishment accept if everything goes well, what the GNB does is basically whatever message uh, we piggybacked, we it takes it and it forwards it to UE. Uh, and it also sends a uh, PDU session resource setup response back to AMF. So now let us take a look at each request uh, in detail. Uh, let us see some of the uh, identifiers. What 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 information is passed? Okay. So uh, starting with PDU session establishment request, this message, like you can see, it is sent from UE to AMF. This is the very first message. Uh, this this message is basically for the PDU session creation. Okay. Uh, and uh, what happens is. Uh, uh, in uh, you can see the message type is PDU session type, and we also get uh, PDU session establishment request. Sorry, and we have the PDU session type which uh, denotes whether it is IPv4, IPv6, or IPv4 v6. Then uh, we have the request type whether it is an initial request. Then we have the SNSSAI, uh, i.e., that is basically uh, saying uh, which slice uh, the PDU session will be. And the DNN here, the DNN is given as internet. Then what what happens is the AMF uh, sends a PDU session resource setup request to the GNB. So what this request has, uh, what this message has, so it it contains elements like PDU session aggregate maximum bitrate, basically PDU session uh, AMBR. It has both for the DL, UL. And then we can see some uh, tunnel information. Uh, the IP address of the uh, core is sent here. And then again, the PDU session type, whether it is IPv4, IPv6, or v4, v6. And then it also is um, uh, given some of the Q. It also contains some of the QS flow parameters, which we'll cover in the QS flow uh, QS flow session. So. For, followed by this, what uh, GNB does is it tries to allocate all all the resources. If it is if it is successful, this is the success message which it, which it sends to the AMF. So uh, it contains uh, uh, the PDU session ID. It contains the uh, some of the tunnel information like like the uh, IP address of the UE. Uh, I may I may sorry the IP address of the GNB. And it also contains the QFI, that is QoS flow identifier of that particular particular QoS. Then uh, moving on, final message which happens is the PDU session establishment accept. So what this message contains uh, is 
all the QoS roles. Again, it contains the PDU session type like IPv4, v6. Uh, it contains the QoS role, uh, QoS rules. It contains uh, information about the session EMBR, uh, how much for the downlink. That in this example, it is two kbps. For how much for the uplink, it is one kbps. Uh, it it has PDU address. This PDU is address is nothing but the tunnel IP address. Uh, which uh, after the PDU session, whatever the tunnel is created, so that tunnel interface IP address we will uh, we will get it here, and then it has NSSAI, which is basically the sl uh, slice identifier. So uh, which slice the PDU session is established, and then we have the DNN, which is internet here. So summarizing again in Magma, we have. This uh, uh, this uh, what we do is we piggyback it. So what what we do first, UE sends uh, UE sends the PDU session establishment request to EMF. EMF sends uh, yeah EMF sends it to SMF. SMF takes policies. Then this SMF forwards it. I mean the session D forwards it to pipeline D, which is UPF. Then pipeline D uh, responds back to SMF. SMF responds to uh, MME and then um, what happens here is um, the PDU session res uh, resource setup request is piggybacked with PDU session establishment accept. And once the GNB is able to allocate all the resources, this PDU session establishment accept is forwarded to uh, uh, UE and PDU session resource setup response is sent back to the EMF. So now let's move on to uh, the demo. So in our demo setup, uh, it, it is the same setup that we had in the previous session. We have the orchestrator where we are able to uh, add all the subscriber information. We have the AGW, which is our magma. We have the GNB UE simulator, which is which we are using is OAI GNB simulator and the data. Uh, I mean data network that is the Internet. So let me take you through the demo just a second. So in this uh, up to now, what we have done is we have installed all uh, we have installed our magma, which is distro magma. You can see we have we have our OAI GNB UE simulator and uh, we are we have fired both of them up. Now both are running. So we will start with the point uh, where we uh, just uh, take a status of uh, I mean, check the status of the MME. So we yeah, are uh, yeah. So we'll check uh, whether all the services are up. Magma D, Pipeline D, all the as you can see, uh, all the services are up. And then we we verify again with by checking the process ID of uh, MME. And then uh, we are going to basically do a packet capture. So. So we turn on packet capture and then we tail our syslog. Then uh, we also uh, tail our MME log. Then followed up by we'll fire up the um, OAI GNB. Yes, OAI GNB is up. We fire up the OAI UE. So now we'll take a look at the MME log. Uh, uh, a note that the MME log has the uh, debug. The log level is debug, so you need to manually set it to debug in order to have all the extra logs which you get from debug. So uh, we will start from registration complete, as this was the message we left in the last session. So after the registration complete, the UE is completely registered. It is authenticated by the network. Now what happens is we can see that PDU session establishment. Um, PDU session establishment request is um, is la has landed on EMF, so we can see that here. Then once the EMF uh, creates the tunnel, uh, I mean the, uh, creates all the resources required, and uh, then it will send a PDU session establishment accept. Okay, so once the now we have our tunnel up, let's check. Um, the interface which it has created. So OAI tunnel UE1 is the interface and it has an IP address ending with 13. So let's now try to uh, uh, 
flows flow some traffic by pinging it by pinging 8.8.8 .8 .8 through the tunnel which we created so as we can see the traffic is flowing uh, and we are getting uh, uh, the ping is i mean the ping is continuing so i'll just fast forward it to and just yeah so uh, after that, what we did, we killed the ping, we killed both the um, uh, UE as well as the GNB. I'll just for fast forward. Yep. And then, yeah. So here are some uh, tables which we can see the OVS tables. So table zero is, represents the incoming table. We can see the N packets here. Uh, which which it displays and then we have the OVS table 13 which is for the QoS flow we can see it here as well and then the uh, outgoing table which is the table uh, 20 so we can uh, we can verify that uh, all uh, the the traffic was actually flowing through the tunnel and as an additional command we have this uh, this command to check uh, from which ip block is um, the ip assigned to the tunnel uh, then we also have this command uh, which shows exactly what IP is assigned to the tunnel. So, yep, that's about it for the demo. Uh, some coming back to the PPT. So, just just summarizing what what all we went through. What is PDU session? It basically provides an end-to-end -end, uh, user plane connectivity between UE and the data network through the UPF. Then we saw the basic, uh, what are the basic parameters, the PDU session identifier, the P NSSA ID, and then PDU. And then we followed up by uh, touching up on QoS low. What is QoS low? It is the lowest granularity uh, on which the policies and the charging are enforced. Uh, each QoS flow will have an identifier. Then we also saw that uh, there can be multiple QoS flows based on the requirement. Uh, and also they are differentiated based on their character characteristics like priority, latency, data rate. Uh, and we also saw that every PDU session will have one, at least one QoS flow, which is the default QoS flow having the lifetime of the PDU session. And then we also saw how exactly uh, the flow happens from UE, GNB to the UPF. Uh, on the radio side, we have the DRB, which is uh, nothing but the uh, radio resources which are allocated. On the uh, GNB, in between the GNB and UPF, we have the tunnel. Um, and the uh, data network is connected through the N6 interface. We saw how this uh, exact flow happens. So PDU session establishment request is sent, and then the pipeline descends back response, and then finally, uh, AMF sends a resource setup request saying GN, uh, to GNB and then uh, also it, it is piggybacked with establishment accept. Then we get a response back from the GNB and this establishment accept message is forwarded to the UE. And we saw a couple of uh, PCAPs as well. Yep. Wonderful, Rashi. Excellent session. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, any questions from anyone to Shashi? No. All right. Um, so I have uh, just um, put my uh, LinkedIn in the chat. Um, those who are not connected with me, please uh, feel free oh. to connect with me. Um, yeah, I, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, Kadar, in the interest of the group, um, I have a couple of questions for Shashi. Um, Sashi, can you talk about uh, what is this OVS table? Because you are talking about OVS table. Maybe a new, new somebody new to the 5G may not be able to understand. Can you say a, a short content about what is this OVS table all about? Uh, so uh, uh, during whenever the tunnel is created, we have a couple of, I mean, we uh, this OVS table, we record all the, I mean, the incoming packet data and the whatever QoS flow data is there. So in table 13, we have the QoS flow data and at the end that which is the outcoming, we have the uh, table 20, which have the out, outgoing packet uh, data. Yeah, maybe I can add a little bit. Uh, yes, so okay. OVS is a, yeah, uh, so OVS is an open V switch. Uh, it's an open source project. Uh, which provides the fast path processing of the packet. 
let's say our Linux kernel can still process the packet without it, but then it will behave like a general purpose OS. Uh, with OVS, what happens is we provide a pipelined architecture which helps packet to navigate fastly uh, within the Linux. So it's like a software based fast path uh, and equivalent to a router uh, which is there at our home. So it provides a faster packet processing uh, in the kernel. Thank you. Uh, and yeah. Then, yeah. It does with uh, various tables, whatever Shashi was mentioning. It configures the table so that uh, that pipe is created. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Yogesh. Yeah. The last line makes sense for everybody. It acts as a router where the incoming packets and outgoing packets are mapped and it makes it into fast path. That That's the important point. Uh, all of us has to take take away message for all of us is to Instead of a normal Linux kernel, this OVS adds to the fast path and it does the routing of packets from incoming to the outcoming in a faster way. Yeah. Thank you, Yogesh. Over to you, uh, Thank you. Kadar. Thank you, Parthiban. Um, yeah. So, like I mentioned, I put my LinkedIn uh, in the in the chat. Uh, those who are not connected, please feel free to connect with me. Um, and also, don't rem forget to, you know, copy the links that I sent. In the chat, if you don't want it to register in Eventbrite, you can click that Cutly link to join uh, in our next uh, session, which is going to happen in two weeks. Um, but I sincerely recommend you go to the Eventbrite and register yourself so the reminder comes and, and you, you you remember. Um, because even for me, sometimes um, because it's biweekly, I tend to forget last minute. Oh no, we have a session, and then uh, we got to prepare. So I just uh, recommend uh, you guys to uh, register in the Eventbrite. So yeah, you know what else? Thanks for joining. Um, wonderful session. Um, I really appreciate Sashi uh, for your, um, you know, a crystal clear, um, uh, very, very, uh, um, you know, um, precise explanation. Um, really enjoyed your session, and I trust everyone else also enjoyed your session. So with that, uh, let's close for today. Uh, you all have a wonderful day, and talk to you guys soon. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you, Kada. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, you all. Thank you. 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 Thank